Just when we thought all of the news was slowing down, we are surprised with some major marketing material and more information about the upcoming Wheel of Time TV show. In today's video, we're gonna be breaking down the incredibly revealing Entertainment Weekly article about the Wheel of Time TV show, including some incredibly revealing pictures, information from Abe Judkins, the showrunner, and some metadata that may give away some plot points from the show. After we break it down, then I'm gonna lay out for you what I think the plot of the show is gonna be based on what we know so far. And don't forget, I will be announcing the winner of the Apple AirPods Pro contest and announcing another contest for this week as well. So join me as we break down all of the TV show and community news around the Wheel of Time for the past week. <laughs> We have a ton to break down today, so let's go ahead and get right to it. Spoiler warning, today's video is gonna carry a spoiler rating of red with major spoilers running all the way through the second book of the series, The Great Hunt. I will also mention some very light things from the prequel novel, New Spring, as well. If you have not read those books in the series, make sure to watch this video at your own risk. You have been warned. So in general, folks, to get you caught up, very early this past Wednesday morning, Pictures started being posted on Twitter from an Entertainment Weekly feature piece on the Wheel of Time. Apparently the digital copy of the article had been available for a short time, but nobody had caught on to it and nobody had seen these. However, once it was noticed as is typical Twitter of Time fashion, the article started making its way around the Wheel of Time community and eventually was released online by Entertainment Weekly magazine. Now you can also go get the physical copy as well as of August 20th. Now the article itself is a feature piece about the upcoming show and contains four never before seen pictures of the show. Those pictures also contain metadata that tell us a good deal about the plot of the show and possibly some of the changes they're making. Then Rafe Judkins, who's the showrunner, answered a few questions on Twitter about the series and what we should expect. So we're gonna take a look at that as well today. Now the best way to tackle all of this is to start with the pictures themselves and break them down one at a time. Now the first picture is of the Emmonsfield Five with Moraine and Lamb. Now there is so much to talk about here, but let's go ahead and just start with the clothing. Isis Mussenden, who is the costume designer, has really done an amazing job here. There is such a distinction between the type of clothing each of the characters is wearing, and it says a lot about where they're from. You see in the Two Rivers kids wearing combinations of woolen cloaks and sheepskin and Rand's case. These are both things that you would find in Emmons Field, something they're pretty much known for. The stitching and the design on those outfits just scream handmade. They don't look mass produced. They don't look like they were made by masters, they look like they were made by people in a village to wear in the village. Even their boots appear to be handmade, they look like, I mean, handmade leather. Now with Lan and Moraine though, their clothing is very distinctly different. Lan is wearing what my friend Jenny from the Lesbian Nerdy YouTube channel called an exact replica of a Korean hanbok. Something that we all speculated Lan was wearing back when the leaked footage of him fighting a Trollic from the Two Rivers happened. He was wearing something similar then. Now Daniel Henney, who plays Lan, is Korean himself, and this appears to be very fitting for Malkiri, as both the Malkiri and the Shinarans from the books are described with Asian motifs. You can also see his Hidori around his hair as well. So Moraine's clothing though is quite a bit nicer in its look, and it obviously looks a lot more expensive. It's clear that she is not from the same place as the other other people. What I love about this also though is that despite her really nice clothes, the bottom of her dress is totally covered in mud and that's showing that they're going to get these characters dirty. These are not meant to just look pretty. They're meant to get out and get in the action. You actually see that with Moraine here. So what else sticks out about the picture? Well, Let's focus on Moraine's ring for a moment. If we zoom in, it appears that this is her Aes Sedai ring, so the Great Serpent ring, but it also looks like there is a blue stone in the ring itself. We're gonna come back to this topic, however, when we get to another one of the pictures because it may make some more sense to talk about at that point. So let's shift gears and then look at Perrin. Anyone who said that Marcus Rutherford was not big enough to play Perrin, I, I would say that he has sufficiently proved us wrong. He is a massive beast of a man, his clothing just screams blacksmith as well. He looks like he literally just walked out of a forge. But anybody else notice what is missing uh, here with Perrin? That's right, no ax. Although Lan and Rand appear to have their weapons, I wouldn't read too much into it in the fact that Perrin doesn't have his ax on him in this picture. They aren't carrying supplies and there aren't horses. They are clearly not walking with everything they have, so I'll probably wait here before making that judgment. 
Matt doesn't actually have his bow here either. So speaking of Matt, I've heard many people say that he looks like he just got out of bed and does not look like the version of Matt they were thinking about in their heads. And I think I would agree on the surface, but there's actually a good reason for this and it comes with the metadata, which we will get to here in a second. But in general, guys, one other thing I would say about this picture, my guess, my good friend Daniel Green made the mention of this in his video on the subject and I agree with him. I do not think that this actual picture is gonna show up in the show. I think this looks a little bit more like a staged, hey, everybody walk towards the camera, let's take a picture for marketing. That's what this one screams. I don't know about that with the other pictures, but definitely this one. Again, they look like they're in a Michael Bay movie walking away from a, uh, an explosion. So I'm waiting for a meme of that. Hint, hint, we'll come back to that later. But let's take a look at the metadata attached to this picture. Because based on this metadata, the picture comes from a scene in episode six as they are approaching the way gate about to meet Loyal. Now, what is metadata? Metadata is information that is sort of attached to a picture in the background. A lot of times people will do that to track their photos. A lot of times these studios do that and we've caught information in the metadata before. So, first of all, Amazon, show us Loyal. I really, really wanna see what Loyal looks like and you are just teasing me with this metadata saying that he's like right on the other side of the camera here. But second, this comes after they've been on the road for a while, which explains the disheveled looks on all of them. But more importantly, it means that Matt is likely carrying the Shadar Logoth dagger at this point, meaning that he has also kind of somewhat let himself go. He's kind of crazy and paranoid. It's possible that he didn't have a beard the whole time up to this and looked a little bit more together at the beginning of the series. And this is him slowly being corrupted. Keep in mind in the books at this point, he had only just been healed of sort of like the taint of the dagger to a degree by Moraine. So that explains his look. Also, Rafe will make a comment on this when we get to the Q&A portion, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. That could also explain a little bit about why Matt looks the way he looks. Another thing I've noticed here though, is the last line in the metadata saying, who is the dragon? Which is certainly an odd thing to be in there. And we're gonna come back to this at the end of the video and I'll let you know what I think is happening. But in general, I think they are trying to basically hide who the Dragon Reborn might be. It's probably not gonna be as obvious as the books. Now let's take a look at the second picture in the article and that is of Rand and Egwene sitting on some rocks in the mountains. Now this is giving me like really good friend or friend zone vibes, not necessarily two people that are in love, but I think that's probably actually the point. This picture is one where the metadata actually tells the story. Now the metadata of the picture here says that Egwene joins Rand he knows what she's going to do. It also tells us that this picture is from episode one of the series. Now the part about Rand knowing what she is about to do will come into play here in a bit when we talk about what may be going on here with the plot. But based on the metadata, this is basically in the two rivers before they all leave and likely before the attack on Winter Night. This is just them hanging out being villagers in the two rivers. The third picture is one of my favorites and it gives us our first glimpse of Alvaro Morte as Loghain. We also get to see some Aes Sedai here as well, including Priyanka Bose as Alana and Claire Perkins as Kareen Nagashi. Now let's start with Loghain here. He is obviously captured at this point, but he still looks menacing and powerful even while he's caged. Like, look at the intensity on his face. Let's also talk about the Aes Sedai. First of all, this is Alana sitting here and most likely holding the shield on Loghain. She's dressed in green, which appears to indicate that the Aes Sedai will often be dressed in the color of their Aja, as they do in the books. We don't know that they will always be in that in, in the show, just like they always aren't in the books, but it seems to be something common they're gonna do. Now, you can also see her great serpent ring with what appears to be a green gem inside of it. It really looks as though Amazon is going with the great serpent rings being different for each Aes Sedai or each Aja. Now, I am not entirely certain how I feel about that change. It means likely that Accepted are not gonna get rings, but it, or if they do get a ring, they have to pick their Aja when they become Accepted. Or maybe their rings don't have jewels. Who knows, but it's kind of an odd choice to add in. Maybe this is just a way for them to make the characters distinct or more likely, it's a way to sell a hell of a lot of merch. Either way, what do you guys think of this change? Is it minor or is it something that's a big deal to you? Let me know in the comments of the video. Now we have some other Aes Sedai here as well. This is Claire Perkins as Kareen Nagashi behind Loghain. This is significant because it confirms that she is just not a part of some New Spring flashback scene. She will be a part of the group that captures Loghain. There have been speculation that she would be a part of a flashback because her character in the books was killed roughly 20 years prior to the start of the story in the events of the New Spring prequel novel. So here she is, 
and that means that she's likely a part of the main storyline. Who knows if she'll actually live though, we'll see. Now there are two unnamed Red Aja sisters riding behind the wagon, and likely more Aes Sedai off camera. Based on some of the previous leaks, I would expect that Kate Fleetwood's Leandrin is with this group as well, just not in the picture. So this metadata does not appear to match the picture that it's attached to. For this photo, the description talks about Egwene and Perrin tracking some wagons to the east and wondering if they're friend or foe. It also mentions the Caroline Grass, something else that does not match this photo. The metadata is more than likely talking about the two of them finding the Tinkers, that's Egwene and Perrin, the, talking about that rather than talking about this scene with Aes Sedai and Loghain. The metadata also says this is a part of episode three, and we know that Loghain scenes were mostly filmed for episode four, and those were believed to be in Gildon, implying that he had not yet been captured. So I really don't think this metadata matches up. Now, Let's take a look at the last picture in the article, and this one is really cool in my opinion. This is clearly a scene from Shadar Logoth. You can see Daniel Henney's Lan holding Moraine outside of a building with two horses off to the side. So let's talk about that aesthetic. This is Shadar Logoth to me. I love the look and I love the feel of it. This appears to be the church in Visluni where we, it was speculated that Shadar Logoth was being filmed when these images were leaked. I love the detail of the architecture though that they've added. The, the area looks old and untouched and has like a really super foreboding feel to it. The article also mentioned some comments from Rafe that building this entire set for 15 minutes of screen time is proof of their attention to detail basically. Now I'm not sure I'd completely take him at his word that exactly 15 minutes uh, of Shadar Logoth was filmed as I think the, really the point that he's trying to make is is they essentially spared no expense. But nevertheless, I am really hoping that we feel the level of detail in the show that they're implying. Now to anyone that is worried that it isn't long enough to spend only 15 minutes there, that's actually quite a decent amount of time to do on a TV show. I think it would feel longer than you realize. For example, very early on when the show was announced, I did a video mapping out how they could do the Eye of the World in four episodes hypothetically. To research that video, I actually watched a number of episodes of Game of Thrones, and I timed how long did each little scene last before they jumped to a different place. So scenes were rarely longer than two or three minutes long. I would be shocked if we spent more than 15 minutes in King's Landing, for example, over the first couple episodes of Game of Thrones, even though that's the main setting. 15 minutes is a decently long time. So I, I really think that that would actually be somewhat appropriate for how long they spend in Shadar Logoth. I know it doesn't sound like it is, but I think it will be. And taking a look at the metadata on this photo, it tells us a bit more about the picture as well. The metadata says that Lan and Moraine exit the temple and race down the street on his war horse. They refer to actually the horses as Aldeeb and Mandarb, so that's confirmed. They also refer to the setting as Shadar Logoth Ruins. This appears to come from episode two as well, which is titled Shadows Waiting. Now, we're gonna factor all of that information in when we get into talking about how the season might play out at the end of the video. But nevertheless, I think this picture looks pretty badass. So let's move on to the accompanying article that came with the photos. Now this is a piece written by Christian Holub for Entertainment Weekly. And from reading the article, Christian does not appear to have read The Wheel of Time before, but actually does a fairly decent job of explaining the show in a different context maybe than book fans would be used to. One thing I've noticed has been a conscious choice from Rafe Judkins in his Comic Con appearance, and now from this article, that they are deliberately trying to position the Wheel of Time as a bridge between Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones. To make a point in the article of mentioning, though, that women in Lord of the Rings are forced to pretend to be men to make a difference in the world, and the women of Game of Thrones are threatened with sexual violence, but in the Wheel of Time, women carry most of the positions of power. They're actually trying to set up the Wheel of Time to be different. They also feature Rosamund Pike's Moraine quite heavily in the article as well, as she is the most popular actress in the show. It appears they are also deliberately obfuscating the Dragon Reborn in the story. They are not making it obvious that it's Rand like it is in the books, which I actually think is a good move. We don't really want to know from the very beginning. So I think that them kind of playing with that a little bit will go over well for a larger audience. Overall, the article doesn't give us much that we haven't heard already, but Rafe Judkins did do a short Q&A on Twitter after all this stuff dropped, so let's take a look at that. Rafe was first asked on Twitter, whose idea was it for Matt to have a beard? And the answer was, 
We aged up the Emmonsfield Five from the books because sometimes TV shows with a bunch of 17 year olds as leads feel more young adult and the Wheel of Time is not young adult. So first of all, I don't think this is a bad idea. For one, if they had to make the cast their actual ages with Egwene being 17 and the boys being like 19, we are left with a cast aging dramatically over the course of what is probably a 10 year run, but it's actually only supposed to be a two to three year span. This decision makes it so the cast can already be a little bit older to begin with, which it won't seem like quite a jump. Secondly, I think they are right to lean away from the young adult aspects. I want the series to be respected and treated in the same light as Game of Thrones, and achieve that type of mainstream popularity. I also want to maintain the horror and adult themes that the books carry, which really can't be done realistically in a young adult show. Imagine Dumai's Wells toned down. I, I don't think anybody wants that. Rafe was then asked if we should expect to see any of the Forsaken in season one. And he answered, it depends on how much you know about the Forsaken. Now this strongly implies that there will be some Forsaken directly in front of us that we won't explicitly know are Forsaken. I am totally on board with that, but if they are not making Forsaken the actual villains of the first season, it does imply that they are leaning more into the shadow in general and dark friends really being the main baddies rather than the Forsaken showing up and running the show. I don't think this is an awful idea as long as the stakes remain high and it doesn't feel like they're fighting lower tier villains. Rafe was next asked, will the world of dreams be in the show? And he responded by saying, how could you do the show without it? Now this is something that he's mentioned before, but it is certainly refreshing to hear. The world of dreams is one of those things that makes the Wheel of Time unique in my opinion, and it plays such a large role in the character development for both Perrin and Egwene throughout the story, as well as certain elements driving the plot forward at times. I'm happy to hear that this is going to be a part of the show. I'm excited to see how they do it. Rafe was then asked, how are you feeling, Rafe? Feels good to see the fandom freaking out on a Wednesday? Rafe answered, it's so nice. I'm glad people are liking what's out there. The more Twitter of time can get people excited and engaging with these things, the better it is for the show and the more people will get welcomed into this weird world. I can imagine if I were in Rafe's shoes and I was a super fan like he is and I was a part of making this, there is a massive part of you that wants to share what you've made with everyone. And I'm sure he gets impatient to do that. But there's also a part of him that is essentially scared of what people are going to think about what you made. So I, I can feel the little mixed bag of emotions that he's probably going through right now. I'm sure that it does feel good, though, to get a positive response from most fans from this stuff. He additionally mentioned something here that I do think is important for everyone. One, it's very important that we as fans make an impact online with engagement. These are things that marketers and businesses and like Amazon is paying attention to. So whether that is watching and liking other YouTubers, responding to the show account on Twitter, commenting on articles that are released about the show, these things actually help the show reach a larger audience. Finally, Rafe was asked, who is always late to set? And he basically jokingly didn't answer the question. Kind of a joke question, kind of a joke answer. But in general, I think the largest takeaways from Rafe's Q&A was that the cast was aged up a bit for the show. That's something I had not explicitly heard before. What do you guys think of that? Uh, make sure to let me know in the comments of the video. Now, I'm gonna show all of you how I think the show is gonna play out. But before doing that, let me quickly thank the video's sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a subscription box service that sends out a new box each month with some really cool stuff inside of it. I just got this shipment of the Nakiri box, which is an incredibly high-end chef's knife. It cuts so finely that onions barely make me cry when I'm using it. If chef's knives are not up your alley, there are all kinds of other cool boxes based around alcohol, travel, office stuff cool decorations, etc. These subscriptions make great presents and the stuff is like really amazing quality. Click the link in the description of the video and get signed up for Bespoke Post. You will not regret it and you greatly support the channel by doing so. Thanks again to Bespoke Post for sponsoring the video and let's get on back to it. So what I'm gonna walk you through here is a complete guess on my part and it's likely that I'm wrong, but this is for the most part what I've been able to piece together about the first six episodes at least. So let's kick it off with episode one titled Leave Taking. I think this episode serves to introduce us to the main characters in Emmons Field around the time of bell time. From what we've seen in leaked audition scripts and the photo from earlier, it looks like Egwene is deciding to become the apprentice to the wisdom, which would mean that she would move away from Emmons Field and likely not get married, 
which would affect her and Rand's relationship. This is likely what the picture meant when it said, he knows what she's going to do. Then in episode one, we're also going to have Winter Knight and the Trolloc attack. My guess is the episode ends with them needing to leave. Episode two is titled Shadows Waiting and likely begins with the escape at Taran Ferry and potentially Hightower dying to save his ferry and the Emmonsfielders blaming Moraine. They probably do not trust her and they're going to play up those elements. At some point in this episode, they are forced to enter Shadar Logoth and Moraine is either injured or completely worn out trying to fight Shadowspawn or Mashadar, which is why Lan is forced to carry her as they flee the city and the group gets separated at the end of this episode. Episode three is titled A Place of Safety and at this point, Nynaeve catches up with Lan and Moraine and Lan convinces her to heal Moraine. Now this is coming from a leaked audition script that implies that this is when Nynaeve would catch up. Likely also at this time, Perrin and Egwene connect with either Elias, if he's in the show, which we don't know yet, or the Tinkers, which we do know are in the show. Matt and Rand would likely end up meeting Tom at the end in this episode. This is the filming block in which Alexander Willem was seen on the filming and he's the actor playing Tom, so that's what makes sense here. Episode four is titled The Dragon Reborn, and will likely have to do with Loghain and his struggle against the Aes Sedai in Gildon. We know this based on the fact that there are major scenes involving Alvaro Morte that he was filming for in this section. I would also guess that Rand channeling for the first time happens here just as a warning of watching Loghain get captured and then seeing that early on for Rand. Just a guess, but not sure. Episode 5 is titled Blood Calls Blood, and this is a complete guess for me, but I think that this will feature the ways. We don't have much else to go on, it's just a guess based on the title and where it fits from what we do know about the other episodes. Episode 6 is titled The Flame of Tarval, and it is also the episode where we see the first picture of the crew all together coming across the ways during the little Michael Bay walk. Now this may be when they meet the Armalin seat, but again, it's difficult to tell as we really don't have much to go on. But what do you guys think? Make sure to let me know in the comments of the video. What order do you think things are gonna go in? Do you think that the stuff that I've mentioned, obviously I'm leaving a ton out, but the stuff that I did mention, do you think it'll happen in those episodes? Definitely let me know. Now, if you want more in-depth coverage of the Entertainment Weekly article, Make sure to check out the very long live stream content from The Dusty Wheel. Matt had guests Ritima and Lesby Nerdy on to talk about the release live, and it was super interesting. They got to a lot of great stuff. You guys will definitely enjoy that. Additionally, Unraveling the Pattern, What Up, and Rebecca over at Reading the Pattern have covered the, the release as well. I will have links to their videos in the description of this video. Certainly check those out. Also, this past Monday, I had Elliot edits on my live show. Now, Elliot is an experienced Wheel of Time YouTuber who previously made content on another channel and now has his own channel. He released another amazing video on Wednesday that didn't cover the show news, but he does a great job of breaking down some of the lore of the Wheel of Time. Make sure to check him out. Give him a subscription if you like him. I will have all of their channels linked in the description of this video. Lastly today, let me hit both the contest winner from last week and the new contest for the coming week. So first, Let's give away the Apple AirPods Pro. The winner is Chase Salt. Make sure to message me on Discord and I will get the AirPods shipped out to you. Now, if Chase does not answer in the next week, I will pick a new winner by then. But Chase, make sure to message me in Discord. And as I told you in the new format, I will be running a new contest each week and giving away free stuff. This week, I'll be giving out a $50 gift card to shopwheeloftime.com where you can purchase whatever you want. So here's how you get in that contest. First, you have to be subscribed to the channel and you need to both like and comment on this video. Straightforward. Second, this is gonna be a meme contest. I have a channel in the Discord server set up where you can post your meme, but what I want you to do is make the funniest meme out of any of the four pictures from the Entertainment Weekly article. So any of the four pictures we talked about today. I will show some of my favorites that you guys make on next week's show, and then I will give the one that I feel like is the best a $50 gift card to shopwheeloftime.com. So, Make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment on the video. Then, click the link in the description of the video to sign up for the Discord server if you aren't in there already. Then post your best meme of the four picks. I'm looking forward to see what you guys can come up with. I will give you a hint. I love stupid humor and toilet humor, so... Guys, thanks for watching. There's a ton of stuff to cover today. Thanks for staying till the very end. Make sure to check out the Patreon if you want to support what I'm doing here on the channel. That is the absolute best way to support me. Also, don't forget to check out Bespoke Post and get your box. Guys, thanks for watching, and until next time, peace out.
Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do Mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue She prances down the staircase, a fancy us a free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?